Hey, this is The Moment. I'm Brian Koppelman. Thanks for listening. I'm so psyched. My guest today is Josh Groban. There's so much I want to talk to you about, Josh. Um, you are somebody who uh, people, it's funny, I guess now there are going to be some people who know you as an actor primarily from the Netflix yeah, show. Yeah, from that and you know, various cameos and stuff like that. When it was, it's, it's ironic because when I first started in the business, I, like, I couldn't get couch time on a talk show to save my life. Like sure. Nobody wanted to talk talk to me. My songs were super serious, you know, and the idea that there might be some personality or some humor or anything else was just like, no, let's not do that. Now, you know, it's been so interesting. You know, there are people that come up to me and and say that they, they ask if there's anything else that I'm up to. And I'm like, well, I'm working on a new album. I'm like, oh, oh, you're starting this. Oh, you're one of those actors trying to sing now. That's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm wow. saying. That's funny. But of course, Good what you're really, you, man. What Good you're really you. known for is being one of the Good great. Good luck with that. Hey, <laughs> way to break out of that acting pigeonhole. Well, they're probably like, it's easy. We have auto-tune now. So. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, they'll be able, they can make anybody, they can make anybody seem like a singer. Totally. Well, when I first did Ally McBeal, the yes. first thing I ever did, um, people, you know, were writing in and they were asking, "What? Whose voice did you use for that actor? Like, we want to buy that guy's album. Whoever, whoever you used for that actor to lip sync, uh, we want to, we want to get his album." And so it was like it was an education process early on of like, "Oh no, no, that's that's, that's he's one a singer. Per, that's yeah, one yeah. person. Yeah. yeah, that's one dude." No, I mean, I think it became pretty clear you were funny early on, and your when you did get to talk, it was clear that you were of your generation and you were a funny person and you had a point of view about the world i think people assumed it was unintentional at first and then realized like oh no he's in on it like yeah, yeah. i remember i did i did a a, a, a what was it a, the, the emmy's uh tv song medley like uh i don't know seven eight or nine years ago ken Ehrlich wanted me to, to to come out and like sing little snippets of all these different tv shows and i'm like well that's really oppor a great opportunity to just be like super silly let's just let's just have some fun with it we'll seem to have some serious moments in it but sure it's ridiculous you're going from mash to the muppets i mean like how can you not like have course. you know animal and and uh and, and a chorus line and people people didn't know at that point that i was like trying to you know that it was there was a hint of silliness to it and you know stephen colbert is in the room and he's going that was incredible and aol back when there was aol was like could this ruin groban's career you know it was like i mean they either knew I was in on the joke, or they thought this. What is what is this, what is he doing? Right. No. To me, it was always clear that you were uh, oh. more than in on the joke. But it, it, this leads to the thing I really want to talk about a lot, which is what it is to have a voice like yours, mm -hmm. which um, it defines you in such a way that you have to grapple with it, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm um, I'm really interested in the ways in which, and we'll get there. Uh, the ways in which. It's been this incredible gift and something you've had to work at, but also that it, the ways in which it's been a, a burden. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's it, it is uh, it, it it can be both. I mean, f primarily, it's been an incredible ticket to this extraordinary life. I've been so lucky to have the tr you know to be able to travel throughout the world yes. and, and witness all of the um, you know amazing you know beautiful differences we all have through the lens of bringing people together through the arts and through music is is incredible as cliche as it sounds it really is still to, uh pretty pretty extraordinary but you know yeah there are times when just as like a 17 year old kid being signed into this business and having a voice that's you know not pearl jam and i so badly wanted it to be pearl jam um you know it's it's you learn about this the discipline that it takes you learn about um, all the things you're not going to be able to do in order sure. to keep your instrument in check. You can't just polish it off and put it away and go party. Um, you know, and, and I was also singing for a much older audience as a younger yeah. kid. So, you know, there was a, I think a, um, an expectation across the board. Well, it's, it's fascinating because so I, I, right before we went on mic, I started to tell you, and uh, I don't talk about much on here. Sometimes I do, but I grew up in recording studios because my father yeah. was a record producer and publisher sure. and worked with, Barbara Streisand a lot. He made seven Barbara Streisand albums, I think. Yeah. Seven or eight Barbara Streisand albums where he would pick the songs and be in the studio. And um, there were producers on the albums, but most of the time it was my dad and Barbara doing the vocal. Right. And I was there a lot. Yeah. And I watched that. And um, a session musician who was there a lot in the beginning when I was like eight was David Foster, sure. who even then everyone knew, you know, he would sort of arrange on the sessions yeah. even if he wasn't the arranger of the date. Yep. And it was David Foster who picked you, right? Who yes. figured out. So I, I, I remember when that all happened and I always, being a boy, I would look at those musicians and it was often the guys from Toto and, and then David in the, yeah. in the band. Yeah. 
So it'd be like Steve Lukather, David Hungate, uh-huh. Jeff Porcaro, and then sure. um, David often on the yeah, yeah. On piano or right, right, right. keyboards. And it was those sessions are legendary. I mean, those those sessions. I mean, when I was first signed by David, you know, I mean, most of the stories he would tell were from those days when he was. I mean, at that point, he was a session player, wasn't he? I mean, he was. Yeah, he he was a session. I mean, he was a songwriter for sure. but he was a session player. Yeah, yeah, he would come in, but they knew. I remember, I remember the way my father would talk about all the different musicians. And this world is gone mostly, right, right, Josh? I mean, oh yeah. I guess you have musicians who are great session players, but most people can't afford them anymore. I, I came in at the tail end, like the very tail end of this kind of golden age of still still needing to have everybody in the room, like really needing to have everybody in the room playing together. Um, there are a million ways you can do it now, which makes recording much more versatile and all that. But I no, I am I am in a very privileged position where I can still, you know, I can still book the Sony scoring stage and things like that. And I can get, you know, an orchestra in there and we can do it that way. Uh, yeah, there's a great uh, documentary on Tommy Tedesco where mm-hmm. it's all about how these musicians, the, this kind of the generation before when I was around it, did it. But when you thought about back then, if you were just a virtuosic musician and able to play across different genres, if you were Michael Landau or Tim Pierce mm-hmm. or Lukather, you could have this incredible kind of life playing music with all these different totally. people. But he, here's where I, I, I want to start, and it's an odd odd place in a way. Um, my, my son had a friend who, when he was 13, was... Um, a scratch golfer. He just was just had this crazy, unbelievable ability. And I remember going out to play golf with him because I wanted to see if he was as good as the kids were saying. And he went out and shot like a 68 on a very, very hard golf course, which is an incredibly low, amazing score at 13 or 14. And the thing that I noticed was how freely he was able to swing. He would be in this weird sand trap and it just didn't bother him the way it would bother people. And he could put the thing to an inch and he played with this huge smile. And then just a couple of years later when he was playing for the state championship, he wasn't, it, it was so much harder. Mm-hmm. I saw all the pressure on yep. him. The gift was no longer this just incredible gift that he'd worked for, but the power of being great at a young age mm. was amazing to him. And when I look at some of your early appearances, I see a kind of a freedom yeah. in you, that rehearsal footage of you with mm-hmm. Celine. D- didn't know any better. And there's this nerves like hell. I mean, I mean, it wasn't a lack of. But once you opened your mouth, pressure. you were doing your thing. Right, right. I'm, I'm at right. Yes. I mean, but yeah. that's what made it remarkable was I, you were nervous. She talks about it in that clip, right? But when you started to sing, yeah, you, you were you, freed. It seems there's there was there's so much, as singers we're all crazy because you know we, when we look at our older footage and and there is there is a blessing and a curse to the naivete that the lack of training. Uh, you need the training. I could not have sung a two-hour concert then. You know, I would I would not have known what I was doing then to get through eight shows a week on Broadway or to sing sixteen songs or to understand the structure of how to write a song or or you know sing beyond a certain range with the right technique. There are things that I I would not have been able to have a long career if I didn't start to really dive into those things. But that 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 freedom that, as my voice coach says it, like just. Just get at, just throw it off a balcony. Just throw it, just, just do it. It's, it's like sometimes like if you're, if I'm in the gym, I'm working with a new trainer and I'm out really out of shape. Like the first time I'll be asked to do something, I'll just, it'd be like, oh yeah, cool. And they'll be like, wow, Josh, really good form. That was, that was really actually very excellent considering you've never done that before. It's the second time I do it that isn't like feels wonky and feels weird because now I'm thinking about it. I've got good form. So I better, you know, it's like, and there is, there is a freedom to just trusting your gift, trusting your talent, trusting, I don't know how it feels uh, rather than how it sounds. Because after you've heard yourself so many times, you want to repeat that you've listened to yourself record, you've listened to, you know, yourself on stage and you've, you want to match a certain thing. And so you're thinking of all the ways you might not be able to match that. There's a great freedom in not having achieved anything yet. Yes. Yeah. I mean, how, and, and, and with a voice in particular, which is something in some ways people are either born with or they're not, uh, I'm sure this idea of working for it and working on it makes you somehow feel you earned it. Right. As opposed to feeling like you were just graced with it. Right. Well, a- absolutely. I mean, I, and I wasn't a confident kid. So I like having a David Foster in my life to say, hey, I'm going to throw you out there and, and, uh, 
you know, it was, it was trial by fire sometimes. We, I, I just sat down for a, a David Foster documentary that's being made. And we were talking about all the times in the studio and, and he was really trying to, you know, uh, the, the, the director was really trying to push me to, you know, were there any difficult times or anything? And no, not really. And I was thinking this one time though, that this was more of like a tough love thing, but you know, there was a night we were doing a concert and, and it was a charity concert and I was really, I was not feeling well. I was just, I was in my yeah. head again. We'd done it 50 times. And I said, David, I, I just, <clears throat> I'm feeling really tight today. I, I don't know if I'm coming down with something, but I, look, can I just take out the high note? Can I just take out the high note tonight? I just, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling comfortable. I think I'm going to flop out there. And David puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, man, it's just about the voice. They just want to hear you sing beautifully. Don't worry about the high note. We're just happy you're here. Go for it. I said, thank you so much. I go out there. <laughs> we're out there uh, and we're playing the song and it's it's swelling. And, you know, David, when he emcees an event, he's on the piano, but he's also got a microphone sure. at, his, at his piano. And, um, and we're about to sing and I'm singing this song and I'm thinking I'm just going to not sing this high note. And David, suddenly as the crescendo is happening, on mic goes here comes the high note i love it he says it in the middle of the song and and i sang it and of it course, came out you beautifully yeah you know and um you know it's it's i wish to god that i had at that age the kind of ego or co self-confidence to say i got the high note i got it how many times you want to hear it sure but i was i was i was not that guy you know so it's 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 uh can you find your way back to singing that free though can you find your way? Did you have you yeah. trained yourself mental, to be able to find games. your way back to the yeah. freedom of it's it? It's mental games. There's certain things you have to unlearn. There's certain things through, when, through all the years of learning. There are certain things after you've learned those things that you have to unwind and unlearn. Uh, and I think one of them truly is that you do the work off stage. You work and you work and you work and you just dive into the process so that you can get out there and and really only think about the process. 20% of the time and the rest of it is strictly interpretation and trusting that you have done the work to go out there and and throw it off the balcony you know so because that's uh there are times where where you know after the initial breakthrough and before I felt like I got my many thousand hours in where I was kind of I was kind of thinking a lot out there because you were th were you thinking you had to go prove it again each time or something like because they were there because they loved your songs and your voice, right? And they wanted well, you yeah, to communicate yes. with them. And so were you, instead of thinking about touching and communicating with them, you were thinking about sort of, uh, you were intellectualizing I was intellectual the, I have to, I was I have in, to do yeah, this. I was intellectualizing it. I, I'm, I've got this, I've got this, another terrible curse of mine is that when something gets to be um, comfortable, sure. I view it as too easy and I have to some, somehow make it harder on myself. Uh, I, I will try and, uh, you know, outthink my way of, out of something that is, is so magical if I just let it happen, but I got to find a way to make it harder. I got to add weight to the, to the, to the equipment. And, uh, and so that was something I needed to unlearn. Said it before, cause I mean it. There's nothing easier than talking about the New Yorker magazine. I have been reading the New Yorker closely for, I mean, it feels like forever. Quite simply, The New Yorker represents the best writing in America today. Uh, besides publishing those great writers, The New Yorker holds people in power accountable through rigorous reporting and compelling storytelling. Online and in print, The New Yorker covers a full range of topics, politics, news, international affairs, climate change, the environment, pop culture, the arts, fiction, food, cartoons, the best cartoons. When you think about the people who write for the New Yorker. I mean, you have people like Ronan Farrow, who is maybe the most brilliant young reporter working today. He broke the stories on Harvey Weinstein and Les Moonves, and uh, he won a Pulitzer Prize for the New Yorker just this year, just in 2018, last year. You got uh, Gia Tolentino, who writes cultural criticism. You've got uh, Sheila Kolhatkar, award-winning writer who joined in 2016 and writes about business and economic issues. My buddy, Helen Rosner, who's a James Beard award-winning food writer. And she's a roving food correspondent, contributing essays and reported stories on all things gastronomic. Look, you can get 12 weeks for just six bucks. That's half the regular price, plus the New Yorker tote bag. Home delivery, the print edition each week. Unlimited access to newyorker.com with 10 to 15 exclusive site-only stories every day access to our apps, online archive, crossword puzzle, and more. Get 12 weeks of The New Yorker for just six bucks. Plus, get an executive tote. Go to newyorker.com slash moment. Listeners save 50% when they enter moment. So do it. Talk a little bit about, because I, 
I, I was thinking about this this week as I was thinking about talking to you. And, and in a way, being born with the ability to do what you do, being born with your tone, and I know tone is, I want to ask you about working on tone. Sure. But being born with the tone mm-hmm. and the ability to have a natural vibrato mm-hmm. and hit the notes, mm-hmm. it is a gift like being born the most beautiful woman in the world or being seven, <laughs> foot t- being seven feet tall. Sure. Like it is a freak of nature mm-hmm. kind of thing. You can either do something with it or not, right. but you're born with it. I'm, and I've, yeah. I've been wondering like what that feels like and how you negotiated the idea of it to yourself the guilt that might come with it or like all that stuff. Yeah, I, I never thought of anything of mine as being special. I, I, I For real? For real. Uh, I never thought of it as, if someone, if, if, if David Foster hadn't said, hey kid, there's something really great there. Uh, if uh, a voice teacher named Seth Riggs who, who lived down the street from my parents in Hancock Park and I went to school with his, I went to elementary school with his son, didn't say during a Boy Scout field trip to his house, you've got something special and I'll give you lessons for half price. <laughs> you know, like I, th- these are moments where other people had to say, there's a really special light bulb here that needs to be cranked a little ho- lighter. Mm-hmm. Um, I would never have uh, had the the wherewithal to say, well, what I've got is something really, really special for the world. I enjoyed doing it. I would lock myself in my room and I'd sing along to things. But, you know, to be honest, would it have... Would it have stayed secret? I, I don't know. I, I joined the choir. I sat in the back of the choir. It was, again, it was a teacher. What do you well, mean you sat in the back of the I choir? I stood in the back. I stood in the back. I wanted to blend in. I blend. I blended but the in. The person sitting to your left or right must. I mean, I remember being in those choirs. Yeah. And the kids who could really sing. Yeah. I mean, I was in choir with Melissa Erico. Right. I mean, she was. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Melissa's four years younger than <laughs> than I am, or something. Or if I wasn't in choir with her, like I saw her in choir. Right. My, right. Right. My sister was in choir with oh, Melissa. Yeah. yeah. And you know. Everybody knew. You're going to notice. Everybody knew what Melissa could do. Of course. Now, she had a lot of self-confidence at a young age. Sure. But when she opened her mouth, and if people don't know, she's not nearly as famous as as you are, Josh, but to people who sing. She's brilliant. She's a brilliant, brilliant singer and been on Broadway since she was 17 and all that stuff. And just released a Sondheim Sondheim album. Yes, she did. She's an incredible Sondheim interpreter. People are freaking out about. Wonderful. But once I saw her at 14 yeah. and 15 and I, it was clear what she was. Yeah. My sister was a great singer, but next to Melissa, my sister was a great local, like a great high school singer. Yeah. And then next to Melissa, it was like, oh, that's a different level Interesting. instrument. Interesting. So yeah. how, what did it feel like to you to sing? Let me ask you that that way. When you would <laughs> sing something, yeah. what was going on inside you? It, it was for me... Uh, and, and again, this, these are these aha moments you have when you're finally given a moment to uh, express yourself because it's a it's an assignment. This is why I'm such a big proponent of arts education in schools because not just because it's giving the kids who are show offy a chance to shine, but I think even more importantly, it's yeah. giving the kids who wouldn't raise their hand to go do it the uh, the assignment to go do it. Uh, I needed the assignment. I needed to be pulled to the front in order to finally have the courage to do it more often. Uh, and when I sang, and when I sang a song uh, that meant something to me, it it allowed me to communicate in a way that I, I never felt I was able to do through speaking. I was getting bad grades. I had a hard time making friends. I was picked on because I was shy, um, and the shyness made me weird. And, uh, you know, it, I tell the story on stage, but it was that teacher that pulled me to the front and said, hey, Curly, you know, come on, come out here. Uh, you know, this is a song called It's Wonderful. It's George Gershwin. Anyway, uh, the, the cabaret, uh, you know, whatever it is, talent shows next week, you're going to sing it. Good luck. And I just thought I was dead. I thought that was it. That's the end of my end of my life was uh, was going to be on that stage. But, you know, the kids gave me a standing ovation. Could have gone right. either way because kids are cruel. Can be. Uh, but it went great. They gave me a standing ovation. The the bully the next day was like, hey, man, don't stop being you. That was awesome. All uh, right. You know, yeah. and it's like, this is this is this is a thing I can do, you know. And so I started auditioning for the musicals. I was in the chorus, you know. And then eventually I went from the chorus to having the one of the guest starring roles. Did it know? feel to you when you were doing it? Like I know there are times. Most of the time, writing is work and drudgery. And then there are times when I'll write a couple pages of dialogue and it feels like it's coming through me. And I'll I'll be like, well, this is why I do the thing that I do, right? Yeah. When you're when you were singing, even then at sixteen, mm-hmm. seventeen. Did you have a sense that for you it was a different thing? Did you feel like you were flying? Did it yes. feel? They were the happiest moments of my my year were when I was on stage and I was singing. Once I was given 
the okay. Once I was given the green light and I realized this is okay. You can take your take your voice there. You can go there. You can take that spotlight and you can do it and it's allowed. Then those moments became my happiest. It's all I thought about. We had a free period in seventh grade and I asked the theater teacher if during the free period I could start an improv troupe because I just wanted to keep doing stuff. I wanted to keep telling stories. I wanted to make people laugh. I wanted to sing songs. Um, and you know how it, how singing feels to you is a, a constant love hate uh, relationship. Why? I, it's it's there are mostly moments of great freedom and and you feel it from your feet all the way through your head and uh, but then there are also a lot of moments where it feels really strange to you and it is a uh, a euphoric experience for your audience, sure. but you're not. Uh, experiencing it the same way. You're doing everything you need to to express the song and think about your technique, but your face is vibrating strange. With you know now with a monitor, we've got ear monitors, and you know one ear in, one ear out. You know the floor monitor, <laughs> yeah, how much sure. you crank it. You got a whole guy on the side of the stage whose sole purpose is just to give you a different concert than the audience is getting. The one you need to right. do what you do. Right. But the, the the flip side of that is you're you are getting something different than than they're getting. You're getting what you need so you can hear yourself in a way that will give the audience the best uh-huh. show ever. So, you know, so, um, I, I mean, my voice, my, any one of my voice teachers will, will tell you that there are moments where we really high five and we really, we really had a great day. And I, I was both, I was both super focused and super free. Uh, the, the mind and the voice are so connected and I'm usually a pretty anxious person sure. and I have my demons and those demons come into the come into the voice. They really You mean the demons of self-doubt, self-doubt, anxiety, anxiety depression, whatever else. Like if if I'm having an off day, yeah, non-vocally, then I need to do different mental exercises to get myself to the place of being able to just free, free so myself. So the voice the, the singing doesn't bring you back on its own to cuz I, I remember there was this one time in the studio with Barbara. This was like yeah. a very signal memory for me. She was trying to sing and she was obviously famously neurotic. She's talked about it, but she was trying to sing a rock song one day in the studio and mm-hmm. it was going very, it was very difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone asked her to sing this rock song. She was trying to sing it. Mm-hmm. The, the clapping on the two and the four was, it was just challenging. Uh-huh. And the session was kind of a bust and everyone was leaving the studio and she put on this fur coat. She had this handbag mm-hmm. on. And as she was about to leave, she said, you know, can we just, uh, can we just put on one of the ballads? Can we just sing one of them? Yep. And... Everyone went back. Richard Perry was the producer. Everyone oh, went right. back in the, yeah, it was amazing. Everyone yeah. went back in the studio and it was this song called Clear Sailing, which is a beautiful ballad. Mm-hmm. And um, she kept the fur coat on. She kept- Yeah, she was right, one foot out the door. The purse on her thing. Yep. And she closed her eyes and she sang it all the way through. And you literally, it was the kind of material she was yeah. And I saw her oh, yeah. return to herself. Return, yep. And all of us had goosebumps. Yep. It was a crazy, I'll never forget as long as yeah. I live. And I had a friend with me that day and we talk about it all the time. But I saw by, as the music came through her, she returned to a place of peace. Mm. And so does it work like that for you ever yeah. or does it not? Some of the best recordings I've ever made have been at the end of those crazy days. Uh, at the end of those exercising whatever demons you got to get out, yeah. the session was a bust. Everybody's kind of like, no, 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 it was a good, good, good session. You just <laughs> oh, know it worst. was shit. Yeah, you sure. just know it was absolute horse shit. And, uh, and, and you're about, you know, and you're just, you're pulling the car around and you just, you just know it's, it's time to, it's, it's time to call it. You can't win every time. And, you know, a, a really good marriage with a really good producer, just like that teacher that pulled me to the front is the kind of person that's going to say, Hey, before we leave, let's try this. You know, um, I'll bet you it was, it was Richard. It was someone else who kind of said, Hey, Hey, Barbara, you know, why don't we try Why don't we try this just before we head out of here? You don't you never want to go to, go to bed angry. You know, yeah. as, as, a, as, a musician, as a vocalist, it's very important. It's like your last golf shot. You want You want your last thing that you did in there to be something that keeps you confident till the next one. Yeah. You, that's what Hemingway talks about that with writing too. Yeah. Leave when you're feeling kind of good. Right. When right. you're in a little bit oh, of a groove. God, because you live with it. As singers, like, ugh. You really are as good as your last shot, and and I if if I go home after a crap vocal day, I just I really self flog, you know after that really until the next. Do time you I'm listen gonna, obsessively? Do you make them send you roughs, or do you not? Can you? Leave I, it? I I I won't listen because perhaps listening might change my mind about how bad it was. Yeah, and I and you de- want to revel the de- in the, de- the, de- the demon wants to feed the demon wants What's to feed. What's that about? I dude? don't know. It's Come so on. weird. It's so weird. It wants well, to. I- 
Yeah. No, it just, it does. It wants to, it wants to, I want to spin at that point. I'm just, yeah. But I wonder if that has to do with the fact that you were blessed with this thing and you feel responsible to it. I do feel responsible. And I, and I feel like because it's in me. That's what I'm wondering. And that's yeah. the crazy thing about singing is that it's in you. And I, I imagine actors feel the same way about, you know, I, I'm so new to the acting world that I'm still a little bit at that. When you saw me singing at 17, I kind of feel that way about now in the acting world. When I was doing The Good Cop on Netflix, I wasn't allowed to see, I don't know if this is, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but the Netflix, you know, thing is, if you're an actor, you don't get to see a single day. I didn't see myself on screen until yeah, all ten episodes no came out. There's no reason to watch. At and I was begin- certainly at the beginning. Yeah, and I was so. thinking, okay, well, maybe this is a blessing because I don't want to overanalyze. I don't want to look at myself and see. I'm no, just going to have to put yourself in the I'm hands gonna, of the I'm people gonna, making I, the show. With you. I trusted everybody, and I, that trust is so important. So it was, it was. Whereas now in singing, like every little thing, I'll go in and I'll listen and I'll, and I'll think. It was a good lesson to just let it go, let it, let the room be what it's going to be. Do you? Co-produce your own albums now, or produce them. I, you know, I real, I, I have, pr- I have produced my own stuff in the past, but I realized that. Um, All right, I read the credits on the last record. Right, you had a, a Steve Jordan produce some of it. Yes, I had Steve Jordan, uh, Bernie Herms, uh, Toby Gad, David Foster, Toby Gad. Remember, um, yeah. You know, I did, I did a Rick Rubin album, which is, which was a whole different uh, ball of wax. That was a, a very interesting experience, and and brilliant. I mean, brilliant. He's brilliant. There's uh, no question. Um, but it was a uh, a real like masterclass. I would say. The experience with Rick was uh, was a result I was super proud of and really, really well received. The process uh, was was more of a class feeling of like, hmm, here, how can I learn? Let's let's take three months and 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 uh, read Rumi, you know, and then and then well, let's come back to it and see if we can somehow change this. Um, it was different from the way I normally splash color on the canvas. Sure. Well, and I wonder about how I've had friends make records with Rick, sure. and I know Rick a little, and I really like him. Yeah, and spending a, a dinner or lunch with he's that guy an incredible is incredible. Amazing. Guy. You walk away just feeling so inspired. Uh, but he, it seems to me that sometimes he will like leave people in the process to have to discover who they are a little bit. Yeah. And it can rattle people. It, and so yes. when you were alone and he wasn't at the studio right. and he didn't check in for three weeks right. because he was letting you yep. flounder, yeah. Yeah. how did you manage How did you manage that? So now you're looking at it as a master class. Sure. But when you were in it, yeah. because a lot of people listen to this are artists and it's scary. Yeah. And when you're sitting you down or Metallica, you've got a band you can bounce your, your neuroses off of. Well, Rick's left us for three, four weeks. You know, guys, let's jam. Let's see what we got, and we'll bring this back to Rick. When you're a solo artist, yeah, how did you that- like it's just you know, it's just you and a piano and a bottle of whiskey, and you're just like, well, you know, let's let's see. And so you're just so and you send tape out into the void, right? You don't hear void. anything. No, 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 exactly, exactly. So you know, it, I, it was. Or did a, you get angry? I I never never at him. No, no, but but I but I would get. I, I mean, I would get you know, suitably frustrated with myself if I didn't feel like I could get a hook right or a bridge right or something. You know, you 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 climb the ten thousand steps to to Master Ruben, and you 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 hope that you hope that what you've yeah. what you've brought him is it will please him. And uh, you know, I I I liked that process. Uh, I would like to have that process again sometime. But I left that process uh, feeling a little bit like I I I did that. I learned a lot, and and a way that I have found that I really like to enjoy making music the most is when I can make a lot of noise and make a lot of mistakes and make them qu- a lot quicker. Sure. Uh, but, um, but no, I, but I, I, I regret nothing about that. And I, I, I uh, and he got me interested in meditation, which was so great. And he just, there's a whole lifestyle to working with, with Rick. Oh, but I yeah. think every often artist, people make the best album every, of their lives. Uh, every him, however they feel in the process can benefit from, from an experience like that. But, um, Anyway, back to the point what, we were talking about, which was uh, no. Was when you, which is, do you listen to the stuff at night and, and, and neuro, how you the process it? and all that? But I guess, uh, uh, did you ever feel like guilty or unworthy of this stuff, or did you just decide you were going to work hard and never bother with that? I feel guilty and unworthy all the time. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm very I'm very sensitive. Yes. I, you know, it's twenty years now that I've been doing this, and. You know, you develop a real thick skin half the time, Ugh. and half the time you're just like, I'm so glad the outer world isn't seeing me crumple like this right now because, you know, uh, I'm just gonna buddy. stay indoors, you know, or take a walk, you know, and and you know, and and especially with social media now and things like that, there's all kinds of ways for you to feel shitty about yourself, but um, but yeah, no, it's it's, I, I will say that I I think that um. It's 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 another blessing and a curse to have that half and half. I know people who are 
one half or the other half all the time. And I think neither really benefit them uh, artistically. Uh, I think that I, I know people who are perfect. They're just perfect. Their voices are the most perfect I've ever heard. Their confidence is perfect. They are these chiseled, 10 octave machines and they have the confidence to back it up. And, uh, and yet there's something that just, I don't, I can't connect to it musically. I, there's something that's missing for me. And then I know that there, and then I know artists that deserve the world on a string and they have, uh, um, out thought themselves out of a career because they are, they are spinning 24 seven. Sure. Uh, I'm very lucky that I have, uh, kind of a whatever side I wake up on the bed thing. No, uh, where it it's goes a, back yeah, and that forth. makes total sense to me. I, I when I had Glenn Phillips from Tell the Wet Sprocket mm -hmm. on the podcast, yeah, and he he and I've been friends since we were yeah, both there. Yeah. He, very Glenn was seventeen when I met him. We've been uh, friends yeah. since we were very very young. Right, right. Super. He sleeps on that couch when <laughs> nice. he's in New York and always has for <laughs> since the career. Sure, but he was as he's he's talked about it. Like he when he was having the, all the hits, it would, like bothered him. Like yeah. some part of the music, and it was so you could feel like that's a guy who was born with this incredible gift for melody, right. and his voice is not a big voice like yours, but like, right. it's a beautiful, magical voice. Right. And I would watch him beat himself up and it would kill me. It's yeah. like, come on, enjoy some of it. Yeah. And some enjoy moments yeah, of it. The, the grass is greener thing is real about like, like you say, so it's not a big, as big a voice as yours. Like there, you know how much I would love to have like a little pipsqueak, like little, just whispery, okay. gravelly pipsqueak. Vo like I would, that's not his, but like, but just, yes. just to have this, like I, there are there are times where like all you just want is something different. All you want is just to be able to do something different and to be able to have that. And sometimes sometimes you have a, an artistic hissy fit and you'll just decide I don't care how people feel about this. I'm doing it, and yeah. you snap out of it. Well, and you I go wonder. Back. It's weird, you know, when you talk about the Pearl Jam thing you mentioned before. Part of the the origins, your origin story. You know, I, when I was when I was when I was just out of college, I would uh, and I was working the record business in L.A. Harry Connick and Ben Wolf were doing their thing where they. We're at on Hollywood Boulevard in this tiny little room. I don't mm -hmm. remember the name of it. But because they were, Harry was from New Orleans and yep. they were doing it the way they were doing it, it was considered cool. Right. Um, and it was the same, mu you know, if you listen to Harry's first couple records, yeah, yeah. it's the same music. Yeah. But he was considered cool. Yep. And so he didn't, he could sort of live in, um, in, in relief to the, what was going on in the popular culture right. without feeling like he was, put on the outside of it. But for you, it feels like because you were brought into the mainstream in the yeah. way you were, yeah. you didn't get, they didn't think you were cool at first. And it right. seems like it bugged you in some way. Well, I mean, anytime you're 19, 20, yeah, and it would have bothered in, me, in business, by the way. You know, but I was trying to understand why Harry was considered one thing in a certain way. And, and I think it has to do with that David Foster was like, maybe, yeah. Because your your music yeah. is cool. Like your music is no, great. <laughs> I, I don't. I first, love your song. First like, of all, I, I love your voice. I, I appreciate that very much. I, I would say that having twenty years of not having to feel like I'm chasing the dragon of cool uh, is has been a, has been another unexpected blessing. Uh, I would well, say that's brilliant insight that well, you have now. Well, There's no, no way no, you no, had that insight no, 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 then, no, dude. No, youth is wasted on the young. Right. I mean, you if did I, not have that insight. At if I ha if I knew then what I know now about not needing X, Y, and yes. Z oh, that's great. of that stuff. Um, I mean, of course, but I mean, that's, I mean, hindsight is so 2020 when it comes to that. I mean, yes, I was, I was basically plucked out of high school. So I was, I was fresh out of already feeling like I was coming from that clicky, wanting to be part of something, wanting to be accepted world. And then to have come right out of high school where I felt kind of like, uh, you know, a bit of an odd, uh, an odd duck anyway, to a music business where I felt like a really odd duck. Um, and at the same time was doing super well, but you know, yeah, it was, there were things that, that were just like, huh, I, I don't feel part of the club. I've never felt part of the club, which is, um, I think good because it's allowed me to write my own playbook. It's allowed me, allowed me to keep my own path, even when it's frustrating that it doesn't feel like there's a lot of other people in it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's weird, but yeah, no, I'll never forget when I, you know, when my first album, um, you know, sold like something like five and a half million yeah. or six million copies. I think it was like the number one, I was the number one selling male artist of the year and didn't get a single Grammy nomination. And I remember not best new artist, not anything like that. I just remember thinking to myself, oh, this is how it's going to be. Oh, this is okay. Ugh. This is, yep. This is how this, I'm going to be an, I'm going to be an outsider. And I'm going to be an unexpected outsider, but I'm going to be an outsider. And you were young enough that it actually 
it hurt. It hurt. I was young enough that it it did. That their it, approval. It, it did that hurt. the approval. No, it's important because sure. we all give. Yeah. We, we we all give. Um, sometimes require permission from some external source. Yeah. Or oh, approval. absolutely. At and that uh, age, a big, it was, it was a big thing in life is to get past. A big was, thing in life is to. If it gets to a place to, where that doesn't to matter. To find a place, that Zen place, that Rick Rubin place, whatever, where where you just it just doesn't matter, and it doesn't. I mean, it really doesn't. Uh, and when when I was that age, it was crushing because also I don't know if you've experienced this. Things are even more crushing when you're overseas and jet lagged. I don't yeah. know. If, I don't know if you've yeah. ever gotten a piece of bad yeah. news when you're traveling, but there's something about getting bad news or feeling crappy while you're also traveling long distances that make the world just crush down on you. Um, and I was getting a crash course in the music industry at that time, so I was that was at a point where I'm going. I'm in the music business now. I was reading Billboard every day. I was reading hits. I was reading all right. these things that oh, my manager well, was just going, don't read that shit. Hits was a bad thing to read as a young person. Back then, as a young person, was, was snarky. Thinking, people don't know it was the snarkiest snarky, magazine I ever. was thinking, you know, and, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm selling as much as this person. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm, I'm going on tour. I'm doing this. And I'm seeing everybody else get written about. And I'm going, you know, it's sell totally a natural fame, to Mr. F- sell a fame, you know, and I'm thinking like, am, am I like, wh- wh- what's going on? Why, you know, and I, I felt completely ignored. Um, not just, not just um, disliked, but, but um, an indifference from the business uh, in spite of all that I was selling. And so, you know, so it was, it was, it was kind of like fresh out of high school, str- back to, back to a feeling of, that there isn't wasn't a lunch table for me, and it was hard. It made it it made me you know sad, <laughs> you know. But I think it gave me. And people sometimes wonder about like, oh well, you got discovered by David Foster. You had this right. big door swung open for you. You know, you didn't have to play sticky clubs to get to where you are. Um, but I will say that uh, there there was there was a huge amount of. Um, self-doubt, uh, depression, um, a feeling of not belonging, wanting to quit, uh, that nobody within that, I mean, and I was going out on stage and I was this wonderkind, you know, singing these these beautiful ballads and people were just going, well, isn't that just, my goodness, you know, what a guy, what, you know, look at this kid. And I'm going, well, thank you very much, Mr. And, and Mrs. America. And funny and yeah, doing the whole thing. Yeah, just doing the whole thing. Oh man. And, so, and totally not feeling like your authentic yeah. self. And half the time it wasn't a mask. And the, the other half of the time I was just dying on the inside. How did you, what did you find what inner resources did you find or external resources to try to recognize that and then begin fixing it? I know I it's a lifelong pursuit to fix it. It, it is. But to begin fixing to it. To begin fixing it. I mean, yes, to the lifelong pursuit aspect of that, um, some of it just is time. Some of it is just still here. Like, you're okay. Like, you're, like it, it, the, the boogeyman mentality that the mic is just going to go away or that um, that you're just one second away from from it not not happening. Now, if I had really psyched myself out, and if I had, um, you know, if I had had gone way off base, then that might have been true. Uh, you know, I I um, had good guidance. I had great parents. I've been so lucky that I had sounding board with my family. I've ha- I've been lucky to have had pretty much great management my whole career good guidance we've sometimes disagreed have sometimes switched managers but but switched excellent managers across the board um and you know and and i think at that time uh the thing that got me out of my shell was um a couple of things. One, starting to write was very, very important for me because it gave me an outlet that was different than just presenting a song as a vocalist. I think get, being given the opportunity to, co- to co-write, collaborate in a room with other people and and share my own ideas, but do it in a way that my fans would also be excited about and accept was really cathartic. Uh, I would say writing is an, is an important thing for, for anybody to do, even if they're not going to share it publicly. Just, just write. Just sit no, at the I piano. Just yeah. write. Just get it out because... That that wound up being very very therapeutic for me. Uh, sitting at the piano and writing, just melodically, not even words. Lyrics are the hard part for me. Uh, was is very very therapeutic. Just compose, just make things. Uh, I think that in a in a time when I was feeling very out of control, where I was getting a lot of songs given to me, somebody was saying, "Hey, we want to hear you sing this." Oh my God, you got to sing this. I was delighted that I was so wanted, but I but I I felt like I needed more of myself 
in those things. And well, that makes yeah. total sense. And now as an adult, I can go back to those older songs and revisit them. And now I've experienced those things. As a as a 19-year-old kid singing about loss yes. and being on this pedestal, this romantic pedestal. I didn't I had a girlfriend. I, I you know, in high school once. Like right. I like I I didn't have the experiences. If you have made the decision to really get yourself together after the new year and save a little bit of money, look good. Harry's Harry's razors fits perfectly into your resolution. Look, Harry's products have won tons of awards, including a 2018 Esquire Grooming Award. They'll keep you looking and feeling great. You know, I don't shave every day because I have a beard, but if I'm stressed and I need to clean it up, Harry's razors work amazingly well. And uh, I don't have to spend a lot of money to get them. They're they're reliable, they're useful, and um, compared to the stuff you'll find on the drugstore shelves, uh, the quality is equal or better, and it's much less expensive. Harry's wants you to start the New Year's off right, so they created a trial offer. Claim yours by going to harrys.com slash moment. Look, Harry's showed up because uh, the founders were tired of paying for razors that were overpriced and overdesigned. They knew a great shave doesn't come from gimmicks like vibrating heads or flex balls or handles that look like spaceships. Tactics the leading brands used to raise prices for years. They fixed that by combining a simple, clean design with quality, durable blades at a fair price. Harry's now has a, a world-class blade factory in Germany. It's making quality blades for over 95 years. And they've received over 25,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot and Google. Harry's replacement cartridges are just $2 each. And there's a 100% quality guarantee. If you don't love your shave, let them know. They will give you a full refund. Get a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave, weighted ergonomic handle, five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, travel blade cover. Listeners of my show can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash moment. Make sure you go to harrys.com slash moment to redeem your offer. Let them know I sent you to help support the show. I did want to ask you what it felt like when you would be presented with a song like You Raise Me Up. Mm -hmm. What, and then the first time you sang it. Yep. So yes, I can, I, and, and having been around that, I, I, I totally understand what it must have been like to be besieged by a bunch of mediocre ballads that you were getting all the time or even sure. good ballads that you yeah. couldn't relate to. Yeah, there were good ones, but then the mediocre but when ones, you, would, you get angry and you say, is this, is this what you want to, is this, right. is this what people this think? Is, what people, think like, I am? Yeah, is this what people want from me? Like, I'm not going to sing the word unicorn. What are you right. talking about? Like, right. uh, come on, there, I have a limit, my friend. I, you know, uh, but when you heard something like yeah. You Raise Me Up, how was that presented yeah. to you? Was it David who presented it to you? Okay, so that song actually had an interesting journey because, um, you know, now it's ubiquitous. It's 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 a song that's just, uh, that everybody, I can't get off stage without singing and, it. And I knew it was on a small album, and all, but but before, but tell, yeah, what's the story? How I, did you? I, I yeah. first heard it in a taxi cab in Dublin when I was promoting my first album. So, so it was it was done by uh, a group called Secret Garden, sung by an amazing singer named Brian Kennedy. And I remember think, sitting in the back of a, of a taxi cab in Dublin. And uh, here, a crazy thing about Irish music and music in Ireland is is it's they they really do love Irish music there. Like in my mind, I'm thinking to myself. Oh, well, like you know, That's we also funny. we all saw River Dance in America, That's but funny. but if you go there, surely it's like. But they dig it. They super dig it, <laughs> and so and they good. are proud of it. And it's like yeah. you listen to the radio when you're in a taxi cab in Dublin, and you are going to hear Irish music, traditional Irish music, and I love that about it. And so I was listening to he raised me up, and and Brian's beautiful rendition of it. He really has, still to this day has my favorite version of the 500 verse. Was he one of the writers of the song? He was not one of the writers of the song. He was the, the lead singer of this group, um, Secret Garden. And um, and uh, it was written by uh, a, a, a Brendan Graham, wonderful Irish lyricist, and a, a Norwegian composer named Rolf Lo uh, Loveland. And um, so I'm listening to it, I'm going, oh, that's that's a pretty song. That's a really pretty song. This is before Shazam. So I just, I just had it in my head, didn't know anything about it. Cut to, I want to say, a year and a half later. I'm in the studio with David, and we're recording, I don't know what, and and uh, somebody from Peer Music comes in the door with, you know, every 
every couple of weeks, one of David's kind of publishing company friends would come in and say, got some stuff. What do you think? And would you guys sit together? We'd sit you together and we'd listen. Oh, this and is we'd, so fascinating we'd, to me. We'd, we, would, we would think about it because, you know, because we had this unexpected great success with the first album. And so all of a sudden we had this pressure and we had so many more songs coming in. There was something so nice about being left alone on the first album. So you would organize it at, at times like, hey, David, David would say to yeah. you, I'm having someone I trust come in. Totally. They're going to play some songs. We'll talk about them. Yes, exactly right. And uh, these were friends of David. These are, you know, you know, after you have an album like that first album, these are David picks up the phone and says, hey, bring in what you got. You know, they're going to come to David's That's house. Jay Landers comes running. That in Jake, and Jay and, and David's sister, James. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. and-, and uh, It's just great. Uh, uh, Jay's one of my favorite people. So, Jay's, yeah. Jay was a huge part of that process. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so, so it I wasn't Jay, but somebody came in uh, that day. From Pure Music, you're from saying. From Pure Music. And uh, I think it was Pure, yeah. Uh, and, and, came, and came in and said, hey, hey, guys, I just- don't mean to interrupt. Hope you guys are great. Why don't you play this song? I heard the song. Don't know anything about it, but I think I think Josh would be great. Hope you guys are great. Play it. I'm going, that's my taxi cab song. I know that song. That's I heard that song in Dublin ages ago. And I mean, we just from the Did we, David right away know also? Immediately. We stopped whatever we were doing and we started we started doing the blueprint of it. He you got started it, making the charts. We started the, making the charts for it that that day. Yeah, David did. And and did you think to your did you think this is gonna be a defining song for me? Not even in that excitement, not even close. No. You just we, thought I like the song. Oh yeah, we just love the song. Um you what know, about when you first heard the arrangement and you're singing it. I mean, I did knew it feel I, a certain way. I oh, I knew it felt amazing. I mean, he brought in this incredible gospel choir. Um, we had, you know, the 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 J.R. Robinson drums wait, treatment. They sent wait, the the choir though came on. After you did your vocal, or did you do a scratch vocal with the choir? We did a scratch vocal with the choir. With the choir, wow. they're there at his house in Malibu, recording in like basically the basically the 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 control room. They're just they're in there with the mic set up, and you're behind the glass. And behind the glass, behind well, it's not even a glass. David Foster had a, had a microphone in the in the closet that he kept his masters. So that was that's his, where you were. That's his vocal booth. I recorded awesome. my first two and a half albums in a closet. Uh, basically, that was his. He had it. It was dead in there. It was no. There was. It was. It was dead enough that you could be in there, and uh, and you know, and, and between takes, you're just looking at all these tapes, all the ta you know, written in Sharpie. You're looking at all the Whitney stuff and Celine and the prayer and you know Chicago, uh, and and you're just thinking, if I just took, if I just pulled one of these out and put it on the spool and just. You'd hear every take. You'd hear every scratch. You'd hear every right. little thing. And you're in thing, there loving it. Just loving it. It was like, it, it was, it was a, it was, it was being, it is the closest thing I've ever felt to like being in a church. You I know? understand that. It's, and when, yeah. when, when you heard, when you, so you go and you, rec you sing the song. Yeah. And then you do your vocal. Yeah, do my vocal. And just, just, you know, as we were doing, you know, David, I know David loves a track when he swivels in his chair with his two peace sign hands up Nixon style and goes, that's how it's fucking done, you know? And we're going, okay, all right, we got it. We got it. That was, that was good. You know, when he swivels and turns oh, that's around. that's awesome. And you, you felt know, it on that. And we felt it. We totally, we felt it from the moment we finished recording that song that we had a great song. We didn't think, we didn't know or think that we had a hit song. We just knew we had a great song. Um, and so, you know, we're at, at that point, we've slid the record under the door, and um, you know we. They're, they're, you mean to you know, the record company? To the record company, yeah. And you know there were a couple of, um, couple of uh, amazing, uh, amazing people at the label who just kind of said, you know, go with me here. Um, and uh, I mean, they knew that was the song. Yeah, yeah. Well, they just said, let's we're go we're gonna go with it, and and I just want you to know it's it's not gonna be the normal route for a hit song. And, um, you know, to people like Phil Costello's credit and uh, a wonderful dear friend that we lost way too soon in Tommy Page. I don't know if you ever knew Tommy Page, but Tommy was an amazing uh, performer in his own right. He was kind of a child star, boy band kind of star. He was a teen pop idol. He wasn't a boy band. But then he went into the music business. And he had the most incredible ear, and he was one of my champions from day one. And uh, he took his own life a couple of years ago. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, but he he had an ear, and he was one of those people who really was behind You Raise Me Up. He was one of those people that said, you know what, this is going to be a different approach from the way we do the rock and the rap and the R&B and all that other stuff. I was so lucky. When I think about my How time- How old were you when you recorded that song? Uh, when think? I recorded You Raised Me Up, let's see. So my first album came out when I was about 21, 22, 23, I want to say. So this was about 24 when it came yeah. out. And- I did it on TV. I just wound up, you know, you go out and you promote an album 
And so you, just, you choose songs to sing on television because for me, radio wasn't really a thing. So my biggest hits, like uh, meaning like press hit, like what, how are we going to get the biggest impact? was if I could be on television with my band and just singing my face oh, off. Sing your whole song, yeah. basically. TV, TV, Was there TV, one TV. appearance for that song that was like the key thing, or was it just you kept going? Um, wow, gosh. I mean, I remember the when that album came out, and I sang, uh, I sang You Raise Me Up uh, on Good Morning America that morning. Um, wow. I mean, it's it it you know, Oprah had me on to do it. That changes everything. Sure. You know? Uh, oh, I've seen, yeah, the thing, I mean, the, you when, on Oprah was one of the all-time great She just, great I mean, that was, and Gail King got, was the reason for that happening. She was a fan before Oprah and told Oprah, listen, I know that there's this kid. I talk about not feeling accepted on that first album, but I'll tell you, the, Oprah having paid attention that early was the reason, was one of the big reasons why it was, it was a, it was a profile on 2020 and it was Oprah. Uh, was the reasons why? So I've you an somehow were able to leapfrog the the normal channels of the business, and you realized the way to do it when you yeah. got on television. Right. You were connecting with these people at home, right? Who maybe weren't the people who were listening to those radio stations, right. exactly. And suddenly right. there was something for them, right? And they were calling in and asking for. They were asking. Oh, cool. re they were requesting the songs, and so we kind of found the side door in the very things that made me feel like the outsider back then. The stuff that made me feel like, why isn't it just? Yeah. Why aren't I just immediately being written about? Why aren't I just immediately at the Grammys? Why aren't I just immediately at all these things? I realized it would be a slow turn of the head because we were coming in this sneak and sneak entrance. Did the money and success though make you feel any better, or did it? Because when you weren't like, because you know you're 22, right? I mean, I know how the record business. Sure. I you know you you set yourself up financially at a yeah. very young age. Yes. But I can imagine how it's distanced. How yes, you could buy yourself a car and a house, and it's amazing, life changing. Sure. Yeah, there's freedom and there's freedom and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. But I, the disconnect between that and what sort of mattered on a day-to-day -day basis for you right. must have been great, oh, right? Really great. And then I, you also couldn't yeah. whine about it because people would be like, but Correct. dude, you're rich. Totally. Of course, of course. And I still can't whine about it. The only, the only you're thing- You're not a whiner. The you're only not, dude, thing, you're not whining. The, but, not, but, but the, only, the only thing that I think is but, important uh, about, about expressing any kind of you know, discomfort or, or you know, discontent about it all is, is only to say in hindsight that- for anybody else that's experiencing I it, it's useful. It's useful for people to know it's that useful. even when you reach a certain level, we all went through that period where we didn't feel like we were enough. We felt like we were out of the club. People didn't like us. And so, yes, were there times where I had my hissy fits where I needed, like, I needed at that point, like, from a good manager at my parents to just be like, dude, you're, dude, you're fine. Like, stop. You know, we all have our, our hissy fits. But in hindsight, I can look back at it and say, no, this was really important and it's especially important to talk about it now. Yeah. Be, because um, learning to recognize that what you're feeling is valid, but then you're in control of changing it right. is like one of the things that allows you to become comfortable in your own skin, totally. right? Yeah. And so having recognizing, you know, I had all the success, but I wasn't happy, mm -hmm. which means the external forces aren't the thing that are things that are going to make me happy. Yep. So I better become responsible for I'm my responsible own happiness. Responsible for my own happiness. No, yeah. in the good or the bad times, totally. that is valid. Totally. Especially, yes, of course. Um, even then, I imagine at the worst hissy fit moment, you recognized privilege and status totally. that you had in the world. Sure. It's clear Absolutely. you're a grounded good person and try hard. Well, I had good parents and 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 also like and also you got to learn those things too. There are times where you lose yourself. You know, they don't they don't give you a manual. When you just uh, when you when you get signed and you start get you just suddenly get money and people suddenly start picking up the phone like Th there needs to be like a little like mini class on like how to deal with the ups and downs of ego and power and all that stuff like it's it's a it's a crazy hit from being some suddenly being in high school and just like feeling like a nobody to suddenly like having the house in Malibu and all that well stuff. I'm wondering how you so having that success I when I started this podcast one of the things I wanted to talk about is exactly this which is yes failure we all uh, there are lots of examples of how to pick yourself up from failure mm -hmm. but actually processing success in its own way emotionally right is yeah. challenging i've actually you know i talk about being disappointed with the failures or feeling not not invited to the party but i actually the biggest thing i've had to work on and still have to work on i'm actually better now with dealing with disappointments i i have a hard time letting the letting the successes and the celebrations last for more than 5 seconds oh, yeah. i really need to smell the roses more 
Um, and that's one thing I've tried to figure out is balance. It's like a neon word is above my head right now, trying to find- That makes sense. Slow down time but, but, when it feels good. But also being so successful so young, when you had some career reversals along the way, how did you then have the, inter what did you do to manage that? You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, it must have, like when the first time something didn't go exactly. That's right. You realize there's, you know, if you've been in this business long enough, there's peaks and valleys. You're going to find yourself in a valley. I've and especially, that. you know, especially when it comes to making decisions about taking ownership of the responsibility for your own happiness destiny. Yes. When you take, when you take responsibility and take ownership of that, it's such an empowering feeling, but it does not come without risk because when you decide to do that and take it into your own hands, the thing that comes from that might not be something anybody cares as much about. Right. You know, and so the, all of a sudden this empowerment trip that you've been on comes out with a, you know, and everybody kind of goes, oh, that's nice. You know, hey, hey, you know, it would be great. Yes. Is if that's, if if there's a, if you sang, a, oh, a Danny, a, a Danny boy would be great. You raised me up. It's so great. Sing Danny boy. It's so similar. Right. You know, no. go, oh, okay. Right. You know, I, yeah. I wanted to stretch. I, yeah, yeah, right. But I wanted to, I was taking ownership and doing this thing, you know, but, but the great thing about, about, um, age and, and time is that you can, f you can find the balance in the dance of that all of it is you, you know, I, I reappreciated those songs that, you know, weren't written by me. They didn't, they weren't me being overly clever. Uh, it was just me singing a song that meant something to me that was passionate and filled with emotion. And I don't need to poo poo that that's a part of my life. And that's a part of what I sing. And I enjoy singing those songs that came at a time in my life where they said, hey, kid, you should sing this well, song. Some of the greatest singers of all time. So yeah. I, I want to ask you this question too, which is, what do you think, before we wrap up, I just have a few sure. more things, like what do you think makes someone a great singer as opposed to just having a great voice? I think that, well, so, somebody in school once, once told me that, you know, from, from a vocal perspective, best, best thing I could have heard because I was so obsessed with being perfect. I was so obsessed with, how do I sing that note better? How do I, how do I, Ooh, that thing that that singer's doing. How do I train myself to do that thing? And I had a teacher that at one point, very early on, said, "You're doing too many things to sound like someone else. Like you're 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 being you're being that person." When I'd sing a song from Les Mis, I would sound just like Javert. When I was doing, you know, uh, a rock song, I was sounding just. I could imitate so perfectly. I'm great at karaoke, by the way. Anybody listening, want to invite uh, me to Korea Town? Let's go. Yeah, it's a little bit of a handicap, but it's 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 so kill. much fun. I yeah. really can do it to any voice, but. But it was that thing of that that there's only one you, you and that the things that are flawed are the things that will make you recognizable. And so it's that rule of like, if in five seconds I can know exactly who that is, I can say, oh, that's Sinatra, that's Mel Torme, that's yeah. you know whoever else, that's Celine. That's um, I know I know the sound of their voice, and uh, and so I think that that understanding, not wanting to to round out the things that that give a little bit of edge to your to your voice. Are, are important and also I think I think that you have to you have to give yourself on stage in a way that's vulnerable I think that it's so easy as a singer especially when you have a good you know quote unquote good or powerful voice to use that as a mask to use that as a crutch to just show off to just say you right, and I was going to yeah. ask you why why Sinatra like and I'm, I nobody watched Sam Harris more closely than I did not mm -hmm. the podcaster Sam Harris the singer right more closely than I did on Star Search when I was mm -hmm. a boy yeah but but what is the thing that makes Sinatra a better singer than Sam Harris? And it's, it, it's the, the, is it the desire to communicate? Tell the story and mean it. Really mean it. Uh, you know, it's really, it's very easy when you have a pretty voice to just go out and just, and, and you can fool some of the people some of the time if you just want to go out and sing well. No, that's why for me, like, um, and singers, you know, some singers like Dylan's voice, some don't. I'm a Dylan fanatic. Yeah. And, and when he sings Shelter from the Storm, yeah. let's say, a beautiful oh, melody. Totally. Like, I'd love to hear you sing that song. <laughs> sure. Actually, you should sing that song. I, that's a good, oh, you should sing that think, song. You're listening <laughs> to the Think Tank. That would with, be yes. really good, cool. actually. You oh, kill that duly song. Duly noted. But Bob singing that, he's just, he communicates yeah. something. Yeah. And do you think about, are you, when you're there singing, yeah. are you telling the story? Are you super conscious of Every communicating time. the story? Every time. And when I'm not, when I'm out of myself, looking at myself on stage, I've, I've got the things that I've learned now with experience or how do I, how do I lasso myself and pull myself back into me and get me back into, into that, that focus. And if I've done it right, I'm emotionally drained at the end of a show. Uh, I've, I've never been one of those people that, you know, uh, can 
pour a couple, pour the drinks and just like party. Woo. Wasn't that great? Wasn't I great? Come backstage. Let's party. Uh, it, it's like once in the blue moon that I feel that way. And it's when everything just lined up where, where it just was flawed. But most of the time I feel pretty drained. I feel kind of down after a show. Because you've given it. I've given it. It's just, it's, and it's not even just a running around on stage drenched like rock no, star thing. Emotionally, emotionally if I've done my job on all 17, 18 songs, then I've, I'm, 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 my tank is empty. And I've gotten, I don't, I want to, I, I see people beforehand. It's not, afterwards, I'm just kind of, I'm in a down place. And it's not until I get huh. on a tour bus, I have my noodles, I have whatever else, I watch some TV, uh, flip on billions, yeah, have sure, my, have you, my yeah. beer, you know, and, and then I find myself, my tank starts to, starts to come back. And anybody who shares a bus with me will know, like, I come out of my back bedroom and he's like, oh, Josh is back. You know, wow. it takes an hour, it takes at least an hour. Right. And, um, and I think that that, is what I appreciate in other singers, whatever their genre. I listen to, to everything, but I think that if you don't let yourself every single time almost fail, I think you find that place where it could go terribly wrong. And it's scary. It's a scary feeling to be in. But again, back to that 17-year-old kid who didn't know any better, uh, I think one of the things that, that he had going for him was that there was no, I didn't have the crutch of knowing how to be perfect because I hadn't done it yet. So all I had was to tell the story. I'm going to go out here. I'm going to sing with Celine. I'm going to sing this lyric. I'm going to, I'm just going to tell the story. I'm probably not ever going to get a record deal, but let's go for it. And uh, there's a great lesson in that. You can't, ultimately, you can't control what people's reactions are going to be. It's, it's, as a, as a teacher once told me, it's not vocal masturbation. You know, it's, it's for them. That makes complete sense to me. Hey, Josh, thanks for coming and thank you so much talking to me, man. Thanks um, for the hospitality. It's been, it's been and so gluten free uh, baked baked items. Yes, from by the way, bakery. Uh, Delicious. My friend Helene Godin's uh, place. Uh, yeah, man, it's been great getting to know you online, and I'm Same so here. glad to get to know you in person and, and have you here. Josh is on Twitter, and and you you will speak out sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, my my relationship with Twitter has been has been. Um, off and on, uh, depending on what me and my shrink decide. <laughs> I completely <laughs> week, understand. Week to week. Sadly, I won't. Uh, I won't discuss that with my my shrink because I don't want to take it away from me. Well, uh, your I mean, your tw- your tweets are, are a, a gift to the world. I have to say, you are you nice. are. Thank you. Uh, you 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 just you use that space. Uh, v- so beautifully, uh, it's an inspiring thing. To, I want to, to do to I, follow you. Thank you. I want to do good on there. I want to do you well, really, but I want to do some good. You, re- so you, thank you, you really are. It's the it's it's well, you've, so, you've somehow been able to bypass the bad habits of Twitter and just been inspirational. But uh, well, thanks for that. I really appreciate hearing that. And, um, and thanks gonna, for reaching out on Twitter. Twitter is what brought us here today. Brought us so, together totally. So this thanks, is like a, yeah. But and, and now the the best thing is I suggested you sing Shelter from the Storm, which I really think you should. I, All right, I everybody. Right uh, thanks for listening. You can find Josh online. Go listen to his records they are absolutely dude you are one of the world's great singers and Thank you. and it is um when i listen you know i started listening to a bunch of your music as we were preparing to do this again and i i feel the thing you're talking about which is i do feel your emotional commitment to these songs and it's um it's a beautiful thing you know the, so the, the the gift that you have and the way that you've uh the way that you've worked to keep it pure. And you guys, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Cobb and you can email me the moment bk at gmail.com. Sorry, I said guys. I know that's a gendered word. So people. All right, everybody. Love. <laughs> See you next time. Thank you.